Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. Today we chat to Sonia Solar about mini brains, or more accurately, organoids as 3D brain models. I have never worked with organoids or anything even like it. <laughs> primarily do a lot of microscopy stuff so we can chat a lot about that part nice yeah but yeah organoids uh, we used to have lab meetings with a lab who worked with organoids and they always had really cool images that i was always very jealous of yes the pictures we get are pretty mm. that's for sure <laughs> they're definitely really really pretty like some of the ones that we see in our lab as well are like it just looks so nice where you see all the different cell types going yes. throughout interacting and <laughs> why don't mine look like that why don't my cells look as pretty <laughs> yeah it's funny because sometimes it really doesn't mean anything it's just a characterization or a routine step that we do but the image is pretty yes <laughs> yeah so I was going to start with a bit about how you've just submitted and ask about how writing was and if you're viral ready and all that kind of stuff. But Emma jumped in and did that before we hit record. <laughs> so, so we'll start with congratulations on getting submitted. Thank and you. Thank good you. luck for what will almost certainly be a really nice, simple viral because what we're about to talk about is some really cool work. And it looks like you've kind of, when I was reading it, every question I had, you kind of answered in the next figure. So it looks like you've got a really good, what's going to be a really, really good paper. So I think congratulations all around are in order. Thanks. Thank you. Luckily for me, I had some time to uh, to write my thesis. Like I have some colleagues that had to rush a lot with mm. the last experiments. And then, yeah, in the end, you have like a couple of months to write, which can be then a very stressful process. I wrote mine in six weeks. It was... Oh my God. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. You wrote your thesis in six weeks. Yeah. Oh my god! I took like three months. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. And and did you did you manage well? Was your brain in shape afterwards? <laughs> um, I, so I, the reason I had to do it so quickly is I had a job lined up. I definitely wasn't ready to start that new job. It was a job in a brand new lab, so it was setting up the lab as well. And I just definitely should have taken a bit of a break between those two things, but just didn't have the time. Yeah, no, for me, it worked well. Of course, it was stressful because you always have this anxiety behind, mm. but uh, it, it worked well for me. And you also speak a whole bunch of languages, five <laughs> of which you say you speak fluently. So did you just chop and change? It was one paragraph in one language and then jump to the next paragraph and write it in a different language, <laughs> just to keep the examiners on their toes. No, I, I wouldn't do that to the examiners, to be honest. <laughs> it would be a bit mean. No, I have three languages in the acknowledgements. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because I, so I'm from Barcelona. So I already speak two languages, basically in there, everyone, pretty much everyone speaks Catalan and Spanish fluently. And then, of course, you have English. That is the must always. And uh, yeah, also I live in a very multilingual country. Now I'm living in Luxembourg. And so in here, they speak a whole bunch of, of languages. They speak uh, German, they speak French, they speak Luxembourgish. So I speak also uh, French and I'm learning Luxembourgish now. And I, I also speak Portuguese. Very random, but uh, I also do. <laughs> well, I'm impressed. I speak English <laughs> and not great. No, but in the end, uh, people that speak multiple languages, what I, what I say always is that in the end, I don't speak any anything I don't speak anything well like not even my my mother tongue I I start making weird mistakes so it's it's funny yeah so I guess a, a good sensible starting point would be for you to give us a little overview of what it is we're going to be talking about today yes so um this preprint that you can find now in bioarchive that I am very happy about is basically a very big part of my PhD. And in my PhD, basically, I worked on trying to increase the complexity of midbrain organoid systems. So basically, I guess you're familiar with organoid models. Well, you, Johnny, said that uh, not so much, but basically, I work in a I work in a research center that is pretty much focused on Parkinson's disease, and uh, everyone uses their stem cell models to well to study Parkinson's, mostly genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. And in uh, the group where I'm working, we work with uh, 
midbrain specific organoids from healthy individuals or Parkinson's disease patients, so IPSC derived. And basically, these midbrain organoids, we can consider them like as mini brains from these patients or healthy people specifically the midbrain part, which is the most affected part uh, by Parkinson's disease. So my PhD thesis, and especially the work that I carried out for this manuscript, was about incorporating microglia in the system. Because these uh, midbrain organoids, so their starting cell population, is a neural stem cell population that is already kind of pre-patterned to, to have a midbrain identity. So it's basically ectodermal. And microglia is uh, mesoderm derived, so it doesn't raise in the system innately. Um, there are some very interesting papers, especially I, I remember one from Ormel, where they use iPSC derived cerebral organoids and they show that microglia in there innately develop within the system, which is pretty cool because then you don't have to go through all the incorporating process. But for in our case, because it's um, it's a, what is called a guided differentiation, so we want a really specific region of the brain. This is not possible, so we have to start by already a pre-patterned cellular population, and uh, well, therefore we have this issue that microglia don't innately differentiate within the system. So the entire story of this preprint is that the incorporation of microglia and what happens once these midbrain organoids have microglia in there, what are the differences, especially from a gene expression point of view. So for the benefit of folk like me, could you explain what an organoid is? And you've also used the term assembloid in your preprint. Yes. Uh, and maybe also just cover briefly what microglia are. I know what they are, but some people might not. Yes. Um, well, I feel a bit how to say, threatened by an immunologist, because I don't know so much about immunology, but yes. Neither so do I, it's okay. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> so yes, an organoid system is basically a cell culture model that tries to mimic a, an organ, basically, like talking very sim simply. So in our case, we use midbrain organoids. Midbrain is a part of the brain stem that is an, an area of the brain located more or less in the center, anatomically speaking. So uh, basically what we do is we have iPSCs that are reprogrammed from uh, skin cells, from fibroblasts, from people, uh, patients and healthy individuals. And uh, basically these iPSCs, we transform them, we, we, we differentiate them into these neural precursor cells. So we have a, a cell line in 2D in a six-wheel plate there that we detach and we put in a ultra-low attachment uh, U-shape, U-bottom 96-wheel plate. So it forms a ball that normally is called a spheroid because uh, it has this spherical uh, shape. And this uh, normally when these spheroids increase the complexity, they self-organize in there and you can see kind of a bit more complex structures, differentiated cell types, etc. You can call that an organoid. And we specifically do that to get midbrain organoids that we characterize by the expression of midbrain specific markers, midbrain neurons, especially dopaminergic that are the ones affected in Parkinson's disease. So in our case, that's our organoids. And then, of course, like science is advancing super quickly and it's very cool because now a lot of people are, are working with what is called assembloids, right? And assembloids normally are a fusion of organoid systems. Uh, so basically you can fuse two organoids or you can co-culture organoids with other cell types. So it increases the complexity of the system. So some people talk about the multi-lineage assembloids. So you have ectodermal and endodermal there, uh, cell types there, or mesodermal in case of microglia. Also, there are some cool uh, works with enteric neurons actually in, connect in connection with, uh, with brain organoids to study the brain-gut axis. So these technologies are advancing super quickly into assembloids, uh, multi-organoid systems, assembloid on chip, organoid on chip, and these things are super cool because you can really study interactions between cell types and systems. And in the end, uh, you, you can even have what is called almost a human on chip, right? So you have like multi-organ connected with different cell types. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting. It's super cool. I mean, the, the benefit of these systems, of course, is that it gets you much closer to what is really going on than sort of traditional cell culture does, but without needing to use a mouse or a human. It's hard yes. to use humans. It's, it's not allowed to use humans. So you say it's hard <laughs> to use humans. 
No. So I guess a logical next step would be to have, uh, so, you know, these are still things that are ultimately contained in sort of culture medium and in a dish. So, I mean, the, the chip aspect is probably answering this question, but have people started to do these things where you've got organoids, but you've got blood flow with them or you're mimicking blood flow and that kind of thing. Are we, are we getting to that level of complexity? Yes, yes, I think we are. Um, actually, it's funny because the other part of my PhD is about it trying to incorporate vasculature into the organoids and trying to get somehow not blood, but medium flow in there, like perfusing them. This is still not uh, achieved, but uh, I've also read quite a bit on that. Mm. And indeed, as you said, the cheap, uh, the cheap systems are pretty much the answers. In, in here, I see a lot of synergies between um, tissue engineering and cellular biology, because a lot of, uh, there are a lot of papers and preprints about engineered scaffolds that uh, scientists use to grow the organoids on or in somehow. And these scaffolds are sometimes perfusable. And then you can basically pump in the medium or, or whatever, yeah, the, the culture medium in there to kind of mimic a vasculature system. So at, in my case, I'm trying to make assembloids actually with blood vessel organoids and midbrain organoids with microglia and trying to get in the end a system with microglia, with blood vessels, and try to get these blood vessels close and luckily perfusible. So you have there a system pretty much complete about the, the human midbrain. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of things are going on uh, with tissue engineering and with hydrogels, with scaffolds, and it's, it's super cool what they do. Mm, I mean, it sounds super complex, just, you know, just thinking of cell culture, it can be so difficult to culture two different cells together, never mind multiplying you know, organoids together. So, I mean, what is your day to day like? How, how is that? Because it's also quite a long, and Emma will speak to this, it's quite a long protocol. So, you know, if something goes wrong, you basically have a month to uh, kind of restart and get things up again. Whereas, I mean, my PhD was just software, so anything went wrong, it was a day, it was fine. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. That is right. <laughs> but this, you know, this is, it's, it's one of those, you've got to really commit to an experiment and it, it, that must be quite a stressful thing to do day to day, I imagine. Yes, it is. It is uh, stressful and it's also, you have always a lot of pressure and also because uh, you're doing your PhD or you're a postdoc, you're, you have always pressure on you hmm. and you need to get results. And especially because it's normally a very long protocol, sometimes you work quick. It has happened to me and I don't know, you put the wrong supplement on the medium and it's two months that go to the bin and uh, it's, it's frustrating. In our case, the, if you start with the iPSCs and then you have to derive the, the, what we call the neuroepithelial stem cells and then generate the organoids and then co-culture them with the microglia, the entire process can be easily two and a half months. And because mm -hmm. I analyzed my data in a kind of an early time point, because I could go for longer actually it's one of the weaknesses of of the preprint i think that if we if we increased a little bit the duration of the culture we could also get a considerable amount of astrocytes and then kind of study the interactions between microglia and astrocytes and this i think we should go to instead of 35 like 45 50 60 days of differentiation which means like already three and a half months entire mm. process you've, you've clearly not learned your lesson then have you <laughs> no <laughs> it's uh no it's it's been yeah i i don't know I always try to make it shorter and in the end I should have made it longer. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's frustrating, but uh, in the end, the result is worth it. I think. Mm. Does Emma agree with that? Um, yeah. If you get the good result, <laughs> I had yes. a bit of trouble with my enteric neuron protocols so that was going up to like 40 days ish, but sometimes the results weren't quite, weren't, they weren't expressing exactly what I wanted them to. And then you just like, cool, I'll, I'll optimize this. And it's another 40 days <laughs> until you can get a result. So it's just, it's just staggering it. I should give you the contact of one of my colleagues. She's working on that. She may, oh, really? she, she may help you. Yes. Uh, it's a project ongoing about uh, connecting the, the midbrain organoids with the intestinal organoids through a channel with enteric neurons. So it's, it's, it's 
pretty cool. And I don't know, I actually don't know what's the status of that, but I could give you the contact. So she yeah, would, sure. she would <laughs> probably maybe help you with that. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be great. Emma gets connections out of every single episode. <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> I think it's just because my lab has, like, Manos likes to have his finger in a lot of pies. Yeah. I like He likes to do a lot of things that are new and, like, up and coming. So we're like a CRISPR screening lab, but we also do organoids. And we do IPSC differentiations and screens in IPSCs. And then we do things like sequencing and stuff as well, like new, that I don't understand. That's awesome. Or loads of stuff. He, he likes to be, well, he likes to do all the new stuff, basically, which is great. But it's a bit stressful sometimes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> You're the one it figuring it out. <laughs> so when it comes to disease models you're looking at parkinson's disease but it seems to be just a cursory glance of literature that a lot of the organoid research at least in terms of neurodegenerative diseases is focused more on parkinson's do we have organoids for other neurodegenerative diseases uh, why why is there such a focus on parkinson's well it's the thing is the research center is pretty much centered on, the, it's, it's focused on Parkinson's disease. So the, all the groups in there are working on Parkinson's disease. And well, it's it, it's important. There are a lot of works going on uh, on Alzheimer's disease, which is the first neurodegenerative disease in the world, mm. and then followed by Parkinson's. And I think Alzheimer's disease, you can find much more things, I think. But I haven't seen a lot of organoid systems to, to study Parkinson's. And I think this can be because... Um, dopaminergic neurons can be tricky. So I think what I have read and what I have heard is that the easiest type of neuron to differentiate and to, to handle and to get in an organoid is kind of a cortical neuron. Also to co-culture with microglia, they, they are happily co-living in the dish and they are they are very happy together. Dopaminergic neurons can be tricky to differentiate. And also in the case of uh, co-culture with microglia, it's very tricky. And this, I think it's one of the highlights of uh, this preprint. And it's the fact that we worked a lot to get a medium, a culture medium that allows for the survival of both dopaminergic neurons and microglia because at the beginning it was it was really hard and just the medium optimization is is one year of work in the end i think it's pretty cool that we use the organized the midbrain organoid system for parkinson's disease because you can really see what's happening to the dopaminergic neurons uh, in in our group we are also trying to advance by uh, obtaining assembloids by fusion of uh, midbrain with striatum organoids and this is because the normally the cell bodies uh, in the midbrain from the papinergic neurons project their axons to the striatum. So you also get the axons from the papinergic neurons in the striatum. So in there you can you can study what is called the nigrostriatal pathway. So the entire neurodegeneration of uh, the papinergic neurons in Parkinson's disease could be modeled there. So I think it's it's super cool that we can get to a, an advanced model and more accurately modeling what's happening in there also with astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia now, um, ideally one day with vasculature, endothelial cells. So yeah, I think it's it's an advantage that we have this model for Parkinson's. And how do you induce Parkinson's disease in the organoid? Because presumably the organoid starts off as a healthy situation. Not necessarily. So what we are doing is we're going for the easy way hmm. and studying a genetic Parkinson's disease. Okay. So we use uh, stem cells from, from patients that have mutations that cause Parkinson's disease or increase the risk to develop Parkinson's disease. We have also engineered lines that are wild type, so healthy lines where a mutation has been introduced, a causative mutation of Parkinson's disease has been introduced, and then we basically study genetic Parkinson's disease. However, in a very small portion, like just a very small subset of our group have has studied toxin exposure to try to mimic somehow idiopathic or environmentally caused Parkinson's disease, which is actually kind of the 80% of the cases. But since it's so difficult to control, we mainly focus on the genetic cases, yes. And you're, you're adding microglia to these organoids. Is this the same proportion you would find physiologically, or are you adding more microglia to sort of amplify the effects that they have? Yes. So that's a very good question. I'm adding a crazy number of uh, macrophage <laughs> precursors into the system. That is that is true. Uh, we tried different proportions. And at the beginning, uh, if you add too few cells, they don't survive in the system because you always have a certain degree of cell death. In the end, what we get is, so we get around 
6.4, I think it was, percent of microglia into the system, which is not, not mimicking 100% what's happening in the embryonic brain, because in the end, our midbrain organoids are kind of uh, mimicking the embryonic midbrain. So we Basically, our hypothesis is that Parkinson's disease has something going on already in during development. So there is something in development already of people that have mutation uh, mutations uh, mm. causing Parkinson's disease. So basically, we get this this proportion that increases throughout the development in, of the brain, and in the end, in the adult brain, is around ten percent. Even though there are different papers and different studies saying different proportions, but basically, I trust uh, immunohistochemistry so chemistry based study that uh, counted around 10%. So it's more kind of mimicking what happens in the adult brain, not so much in the embryonic brain, but this doesn't worry me too much because the proportion can be always adapted. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to go for more, you would add more. If you want to go for less, you would add less precursor cells. And what about the microglial phenotype? Because I'm assuming that would change in Parkinson's disease. And that's probably part of what causes Parkinson's disease. Um, so how are you controlling for that in your experiments? Yes, that is actually one of the limitations of our work for now, because the iPSC-derived microglia are per se a bit activated, just because I think because of the differentiation process, the derivation and the handling in the lab, in the cell culture, it already makes them a bit stressed. So their phenotype is not completely resting. And you can also see that in, in the images. If you if you look for papers that work with APSC-derived microglia, this, this own preprint that we are, we are talking about, they don't look, all of them, perfectly ramified and resting and just chilling in the system, even though I only used wild type lines. So probably if I used a mutant line or a PD, a Parkinson's disease line, I, I haven't done it. So I don't know if I would see such a difference. So now something that we're working on is trying to get them a bit more resting. So we're trying to get the phenotype into a bit more physiological phenotype. And actually, this is something very cool that we are seeing with the vasculature part. Actually, when you have endothelial cells in the system, they look happier. Microglia look more resting. So yes, it's, it's one of the things that should be assessed still. Has anybody looked at macrophage subtypes, well, microglial subtypes in Parkinson's, which is of interest? Um, yes, actually, there's a, there are a lot of studies uh, talking about reactive microgliosis in PD. Basically, a microglia get a, a pro-inflammatory status. They release a bunch of cytoin chemokines, and they actually further advance the neurodegeneration. Mm. So they release a bunch of stuff that uh, damages the dopaminergic neurons and actually... Um, I don't know if I even read some work about targeting microglia as a, as a drug target to try to reduce uh, neuroinflammation and therefore trying to reduce neurodegeneration. So this is something, yeah, it's, it's, it has been studied and it's, it is true that we have a, a neuroinflammation caused, of course, by microglia and astrocytes in PD, and it's a pro-inflammatory phenotype. It's the immune system everywhere. It's clearly the system we should all be working on. Of course. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. It, it's so important. <laughs> uh, um, so Emma presented this at Journal Club, and one of the questions they came up with, we can ask the author. So you did a lot of sequencing in this study, but you used nuclei rather than whole cells. So why, what, where was that choice? Why did you make that choice? So the sequencing part, I have to say, don't, don't be too harsh on the sequencing <laughs> part because it was not me, the one who analyzed. But uh, yes, so basically, of course, we have a lot of mitochondrial genetic material, ribosomal genes, etc., that are sometimes not what we want to see. And um, we have also done uh, single cell sequencing, like I have colleagues, and they have seen like some, how to say, interference of, uh, of mitochondrial information, ribosomal information, that in the end made the data not so clean. It was more difficult to, to distinguish what was what, to distinguish phenotypes, mm. to distinguish pathways, etc. So in the end, because of previous experiences, we saw that going for nuclear sequencing was much cleaner and allowed us to get much uh, more reliable information of what we are getting in the end there you go emma you can report back i can report back to, <laughs> to my lab <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't the point of asking that question i was just generally interested because we do single cell rna seq but we do like whole cell single cell yes. rna seq and i just was wondering 
why the change in difference but yeah it makes sense if you've got previously previous data that suggests there was a contamination or it changed not changed or like kind of made it harder to interpret the results then yes yes it's like this don't don't ask me about the specifics because oh, no, I, I'm the same I, <laughs> I, I, we've got a bioinformatician I don't do, I don't do that side. yes exactly <laughs> same thing but I, I know it's it's because of that. And in the end, it's it's basically much more easier to interpret the data. So you showed in that sequencing data that, that there were a number of genes downregulated involved with oxidative stress. Yes. What's your theory as to why they were downregulated? So we have a, a hypothesis in there. And it's all hypothetical because we um, like we will we will work on further validations with molecular assays, etc. But basically we have seen so this microglia that we inc incorporate, we have also differentiated in 2D, and we saw that they phag phagocytose cymosin particles, so they, they have phagocytosis ability, uh, they are functional from that point of view, and we have also seen then, uh, that phagocytosis-related genes are expressed in microglia in organoids, so especially in the microglia cluster, so that made us think that microglia in the th 3D system are actually functional as well. And then we have also seen that midbrain organoids with microglia, what we call the assembloids, are smaller in size. And also we have an, an image analysis pipeline to detect pignotic nuclei to compare basically the amount of uh, pignotic nuclei in organoids with microglia and without microglia. And we saw that they are less in the organoids with microglia, at least that's what the pipeline detected. So this together with the gene expression data that shows down regulation of oxidative stress related genes made us think that maybe microglia within assembloids are able to somehow phagocytose some metabolic waste products, maybe even some the cellular debris and uh, some stuff that in the end is causing oxidative stress in the system and in the end is leading to a more, let's say, a healthier status in organoids when microglia are there uh, than compared to the system without microglia. So we think this is the story that may be happening. Of course, a confirmation should be done, but it's what we speculate. But why were your assembloids smaller than the organoids? So we think it could be. We have really no clear answer, but we think it could also be because of this, because if microglia are uh, phagocytosing cell debris, the core of the organoid that is very rich in, in uh, dead cells, basically, may be smaller. And in the end, the, the organoid itself may be smaller because of this. It can also be something else that microglia are doing, because in the end, the culture media in both cases is the same. So we are culturing in, in the same conditions for the same amount of time with the same medium. And the only difference is that one has microglia, the other doesn't. So this is one of our hypotheses. Of course, it should be confirmed, but it's the same. It's also matching the fact that this pycnotic nuclei amount is lower. So it could be maybe because of that. We are not sure. I mean, that's a Fairly simple thing to test too, I guess. Yes, yes. So what are your plans with the assembloids? What is it you want to look into further with these? So now I have a colleague, a postdoc in uh, in my group that is already applying this, uh, this model to study genetic Parkinson's disease in LARC2. So it's a gene that it, when it's mutated, it causes Parkinson's disease. And basically he's focusing on neuroinflammation, also seeing if... Uh, for instance, organoids, he, he will look at that uh, in the future, maybe diseased organoids with healthy microglia uh, have milder phenotype than diseased organoids with diseased microglia, or wild-type organoids with diseased microglia are worse than just wild-type organoids with wild-type microglia, and basically to target what is exactly, uh, what are exactly microglia doing in there, how are they contributing to the disease, and what is happening with neuroinflammation in the system. Can you take microglia from patients and use them in your system directly? You mean non-IPSC mm. derived? Do you think that is possible? Obtaining primary know. microglia <laughs> from humans? <laughs> I was just about to say, Johnny, do you know a way that you can do that? <laughs> yes, well, no, no, I, 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 I don't know. I, I have seen uh, studies with the primary mouse microglia mm. in co-culture with uh, human neurons or, or mm. mouse neurons. But to be honest, I don't know how could you get human primary microglia without causing... Uh... Could you differentiate macrophages into microglia? 
I'm, but I mean, I'm, I'm why, why would you do that if you could just get microglia, the different... Microglia? Well, I'm thinking of if you take them directly from a diseased patient. Well, you could mouth. take the iPSC, you could take the skin yeah, cells, could. make them yeah. iPSC that was diseased and then do it, go to microglia. Yeah, but there, there just might be a difference in those more, I don't want to say more natural, but the... The sort <laughs> not <of> reprogrammed <laughs> already differentiated microglia yes compared to the ones you're differentiating that's for sure if you would use primary microglia it's it's a complete different picture they look mm. much more resting it's more much more close to the physiological situation if you like and uh, yeah that's that's the limitation of ipsc derived microglia yes I mean, I wasn't volunteering to give my... my <laughs> I thought you had like a technique you knew about or something. And I'm no. like, oh, that's no, interesting. No, just, just <laughs> I would be interested, yes. <laughs> um, so one of the really cool things about this preprint is that you did all the sequencing. Uh, and that's where most people would have stopped. But you didn't stop there. You then went on to do functional analyses, which I always like to see. So could you talk a little bit about some of the functional assays you did and what they showed? Yes. So some of the stuff we checked we checked was the uh, electrophysiological properties of the neurons in the system with and without microglia. And basically, we had a collaboration where they did patch clamp, single cell patch clamp in the organoids. And then we did a multi-electrode RA uh, assay uh, in our lab. And basically, both assays showed more or less the same and it was it was in both case, both cases just to test the spontaneous activity so we didn't stimulate the system and basically what we saw is that the spontaneous activity of neurons in the case of the organoids with microglia was somehow higher so basically we saw a lower threshold to fire an action potential in neurons from organoids with microglia and basically this more spontaneous activity is somehow uh, associated and it's normally related to a higher neuronal maturation. This we link with the fact that we have upregulated genes uh, related to action potential, for example, and uh, from the single nuclei RNA-seq data that we get. And um, yeah, so basically we, we put all this together, speculating that neurons may be more mature in the presence of microglia. Of course, uh, some more things could and probably will be done, like checking uh, spine morphology in the dopaminergic neurons with microglia to see if they are more complex. Also check specific uh, maturity marker, protein expression, and stuff like this. But uh, it was an insight into what is happening to maturation in there. And I think it, it was pretty cool to see that as well. Well, you're making me want to work with organoids now. So <laughs> You can come with us. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so we should probably move on to the more general preprint e questions we ask. Um, so we like to talk just general experiences in academia with everyone. So one of the things we ask everyone, because it's kind of part of our remit of doing this, but also it's interesting to see why people do it, which is whose decision was it to preprint this? And where did that decision come from? So the decision was basically... I think I don't know if it was my PI first who suggested it or yeah I think it's a normal practice that we do in in my group the thing is this paper the, this preprint was uh, was ready a bit before it was out in in bioarchive but uh, it was also linked to a patent mm. so we couldn't we couldn't uh, share it for the moment yeah. and then well once the patent was like all the documents were perfectly fine and everything was done the first thing my my pi said was let's put it in bioarchive so it's available and I am very happy about it. And I think it's how things should be done because uh, it's, well, the publishing process it can be interesting. A nightmare. <laughs> yes. So I think it's, it's so important that, um, yeah, pre-printing and, and making your data available for everyone so people can also use it and, and use it for, for making their research better mm -hmm. or maybe stop using the approach they are they are using and and going for something different contacting me contacting the first author the last author and and ask for some support i think i think it's how it should be done that, that's what's what we want to hear yes so one of the, you're still early in your, your academic career 
if that's what you're going to have. Um, but you've already seemed to have jumped across fields a little bit. So you've got some new biology, some cardiovascular biology. How do you find that experience? So this is something I've done at sort of every career step. I seem to jump and do, I'm still in immunology, but I seem to work with different immune cells, different part of the immune system, change of different organisms. How do you find doing that? Is that, I mean, it, in terms of this project, it looks like it's been very beneficial. Yes, I, I did that. To be honest, I don't know if that's how most of the people think, but I really like research and I like science and I am a biologist by training and I like biomedicine in general. So I love the topic of my PhD. I, I am, I'm, I'm amazed by it and I really like neurobiology, but I also enjoyed working in microbiology as well. I enjoyed working in cardiovascular diseases. So I think this is also, it also enriches so much your mm -hmm. academic career. And you can also learn so many different techniques that you can then apply to the other fields somehow. And I think also in your case, if you're working in different fields of immunology, for sure, it can be only beneficial. That's what I keep saying. But... Yes. Uh, for me, for me, it is. And and I don't regret at all mm, having jumped like this. And I don't know, um, even if at some point in my past, they would have offered me an internship in plant physiology, probably I would have also gone for that because I find oh, all I, of it so I interesting. Have limits. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, I'm very curious. And uh, well, now now that I, I am in neurobiology and I like it so much and I have seen so much in depth because, of course, in the past it was internships and Erasmus, um, the master's uh, internship. But now that I've seen this topic really in depth, I, I think I, I would like to stay here. But I, I don't regret having jumped like this. I, I am really happy that I did that. Yeah, I think more people should do that. Yeah. So what, what are your future? Are you, you've just handed in. So you obviously immediate plans are viable, um, which... <laughs> Based on this conversation, you're more than prepared for. But what, what are your, your longer term plans? Are you planning to stay in academia or are you going to jump ship at the first opportunity you get? Which is the small thing to do, really. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people think like that. Um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, for now, uh, once I, I defend my thesis, I... I consider myself very lucky because I will stay one year as a postdoc in the group so I can continue my experiments. I can finish some stuff that is unfinished and I'm very happy about it because we have some interesting things that I want to continue and luckily we can get maybe another preprint about the other part of my PhD. And, and so for now, that's what I will do. To be honest, I was so stressed and so busy with the PhD <laughs> that I have not thought for further. So like, it's, I, I have no idea what I will do. Academia is, I think it's, it's very hard. So I don't know if I will forever, like forever is, is a very big word, right? But mm. in the long term, stay in academia. But I am, I am really open to also exploring new career paths, right? So I like academia and I like research, but I am not close to other ways. Which I think is probably the best way to do it. I, every day I think about leaving academia or staying in academia. It depends how the day has been. It's, it's, it can be hard, I think. Especially, yeah, the, the kind of contracts and mm. uh, instability, insecurity. So that's what I was about to get into, which is, you know, one of the things you focused on is one of the negatives is the, the lack of job stability. Um, yes. And I think this is, I mean, this comes up quite a lot here. And I think we've asked somebody this before, but it, what would be the ideal system in your mind? If you were to design academia, what would you do to change that lack of stability? Big question. Big question. <laughs> yes, I I don't on know. On the spot I, as well. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know if I have an I could say stuff, you know, but then probably someone that knows about the system and how it's structured and about the big papers and stuff. Uh, I mean, I I know all this, so you you speak freely. If it sounds terrible, we'll just edit it out. All right. It's a safe space. I don't know. Maybe somehow you. Because it's it's sometimes easy for uh, well easy, it's easier for for example technicians to get permanent positions mm. in a group, and work during a long period of time in in different projects for that group. So maybe an option would also be like trying to do something like this for postdocs you know so instead of being linked to a project that is two years one year three years trying to somehow with HR from whoever you are trying to say okay I am a kind of a permanent postdoc in that group and now I I cannot be fired without getting a, a compensation somehow and I will work in different projects and and I will 
keep being enthusiastic about it. I think I think it shouldn't be so difficult, right? Like, is it crazy what I'm saying? Should, no, no, it shouldn't be. I have heard of some professors who, when they negotiate their contracts, they stipulate that they want a postdoc, not on a grant, but as part of their contract. So as long as they are around, they have the money for a postdoc. And so in theory, you've got a permanent po postdoc. One of the other things that comes up is the, the idea that um, you could have sort of roaming postdocs. So a research institute might pay the salaries of a handful of postdocs and they kind of cover maternity leave or they'll jump on and cover sick leave and things like that. So that they've got a job all year and they're just jumping around different research groups. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think having a postdoc career pathway is desperately needed because it's the one thing that there's so many people who don't want to be a PI and just love being at the bench and want to be a postdoc forever. But it's so difficult to do that. Yes, it, it is crazy. And, and something like this, like a jumping postdoc in a research center, that's also nice if you like the topic of mm. the overall topic of the research center. I just think it, it's it, it's crazy, right? Like being in in a two year contract, imagine that, I don't know, just hypothetically, you are 38 and you're a woman and you want to get pregnant and have a baby. And then you have a two year contract and then you have a pregnancy in between, a labor in between. And like, it, it's, of course, it's hard for men, but I imagine also this situation. Not that hard for us, really. Honestly, <laughs> we have a su we have such an easy ride compared to pretty much anyone else in academia, and it's it's really not fair. It's not how it should be at all. No, I, I think it it and it discourages people, and I think there are so many valid and and super yeah so super intelligent people that that just leave academia when they love academia and just because they cannot handle that anymore mm. and they just want a normal life with a normal job and a normal salary yeah um yeah a normal salary <laughs> yes it'd just be nice not to be like constantly chasing something mm. like oh yeah. we've got to publish in our phd after three years we've got to publish from our first postdoc and if we don't it's not like in an in a a permanent position somewhere where if you don't hit that deadline or you're not you're just working normal nine to five you're not going to lose your job and not be able to find another one I mean exactly. if you do really badly then maybe but not if you've done your job well and you just so happen to be unlucky and things can't get published in time it's just it's yeah. really difficult and then add the whole like having kids and stuff on top of that stresses me out quite a bit <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> But to end on a positive and not a negative, <laughs> I, was, I had to have a think there to figure out how to switch that one background. One of the things you're really excited about in science is the creativity and just where it can go aspect. Yes. Uh, so I love painting. I am. A, I try to be creative. I, I try to be artistic, you know, and somehow I compare it with what you can do in academic research. So mm. in our case, of course, it's not always the same. It depends on the group. It depends on how you organize um, how your PI react but in in my case I was I was quite lucky because I could always choose which way to take which way to go for my experiments also I work in a um, somehow abstract project like yeah there is there is a midbrain organ I just try to optimize it put microglia in there how I don't know but just try to put it in there and uh, not not only in my case but there are other projects with different models and also molecular based project I guess that are similar right like just try to get this how I don't know just somehow be creative right which is kind of there's there's a bit of irony in there because we are meticulous we are scientists we are logic but somehow we also have to be a bit creative I, th I think people forget that is th so I've been doing this thing online where school kids ask you questions I did it all last month um, some of it was really intense and one thing you know one thing they ask is like what subject should we do other than science um, and those kind of things and I always come back to the creative stuff because things like writing skills are obviously really beneficial but also just those things that make you think differently because so much of science is troubleshooting and troubleshooting is nothing more than thinking differently it's coming yeah. at the same problem as many different ways as you could think of doing and people do often forget that i think yeah totally they imagine us somehow as robots that just mm. go one way and cannot imagine and then have some creativity and it's something that I actually learned in my PhD, I think, because at the beginning, you're always scared to ask, and what if we did that? What if we went that way? And in the end, I am like, why not getting microglia from a human person? Let's just do <laughs> the same stuff, right? <laughs> no, uh, really, like uh, now I, I imagine and I ask, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But uh, the possibilities are pretty much endless, I think. And that is exactly where we should end on. 
the yeah. possibilities are endless is yes. a great ending. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it's a positive. Look at that. Look at how that worked out. Anyway, it's not all on. bad, of course. It's not all bad. Some of it's bad. But a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was, I enjoyed that and I learned a lot because I knew basically none of that going into this. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that was really good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was really a very nice. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. So the way we normally do this is we just jump straight in with the questions um, and I will do all the intro stuff separately when John, who's not here, prompts me to do it because he's about to finish the edit off and I still haven't done it. Okay. We're, very, we're a very, very well oiled machine over here. We get everything done on time <laughs> and it's great. It's so much smoother than it we up here. But the result is, is awesome. I have <laughs> listened to some of your podcasts and it's it really looks super well structured and I like all of them, the ones that I've listened to. See, that that's what we like to hear. We we, we need yeah. to get a soundbite of all the guests saying nice things about us <laughs> as an episode. Well, we, really, need to, but... we can clip that. We can clip that soundbite. That would be <laughs> <laughs> I'm being totally honest. I really like it. Good. It's so that's, nice to hear. That's what we're here for. Good. Yes. Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Is that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows.